Good evening, this is the Oscar Expert here, and it's time to talk about Tar. We're doing a spoiler analysis video. We're gonna get into what that final shot meant, what this movie says about Lydia Tar as a character, what she represents, what the movie observes about power dynamics and accountability in our world today, and what questions it's asking about separating the artist from the art. This is a spoiler discussion. This is meant for people who have seen the movie, so if you haven't seen the movie, then watch our review for the movie that's already been posted. You can check that out spoiler free. So first off, let's look at Lydia Tarr as a character. One of the most important things that Lydia Tarr says in the movie is that one must sublimate their identity in the pursuit of their art. That's kind of paraphrasing. And not just for art, but for power. I think for Tarr, power is essential for how she has been able to build herself up and establish herself as an artist. Lydia is someone who has wiped clean her identity and become what she felt she needed to be to succeed. As she says in her interview in the beginning of the film, she doesn't really have an interest in being seen for her gender, despite the fact that it is an accomplishment for a woman to make it to where she is in the field of classical music composing. Tar really is the perfect embodiment of success in an American capitalist society. She's self-made, she's transcended the place that she's from and who she is and is viewed for her success and for her talents. So where did Lydia Tarr come from? Who is she really? We don't really know, it's kind of a mystery, but later in the film, there is a moment where she goes home to what I assume is her family's home to lay low for a bit. And this home, when she gets in there, it feels very foreign to her. Even the piano is detuned. The house is wooden and old looking, very much in contrast to the two apartments that she resides in for most of the movie, which are more modern looking and spacious. The place just doesn't feel like her anymore. We can see how far she has come from this place and her brother even pops in for a bit and he almost feels like a stranger when the way that they're interacting and he has a southern accent so you think maybe Lydia Tarr even changed the way that she speaks as part of her obliterating her identity and if that's not her brother then I'm just misreading the scene but I think that I think it is. At some point in Tarr's life she started listening to the works of classical composers and studying their music. Her guideline for the way that her music is shaped and even the way that she carries and presents herself the identity that she has crafted is influenced by these classical composers. One of the rules of the past that Lydia holds on to very tightly is the idea that her identity is separate from that of her art and that it's not useful to look into who the artist is or their gender or their race or their sexuality, their past, their behavior or their morals. And the scene that really shows how deeply she believes this is when she's arguing with a college student in her lecture class, this pan gender person of color, who says that they don't appreciate the music of Bach or relate to it because he was like an old white guy who had a questionable past. And Lydia attempts to obliterate this argument and make the case for why that should not be the criteria through which we evaluate art. Even though interestingly, in an interview, I saw Todd Field say that he feels that Kate Blanchett lost this argument, which I think is peculiar because it does seem in this moment, you're supposed to think this student gets a little bit destroyed, even if you may think that Lydia Tarr goes too far in how she handles this or that her unwillingness to hear them out was a sign of weakness. But anyway, what is more important than just whatever the movie's stance is on this scene is really why Tar cares so much about this topic. And it's because it advantages her for people to not see her for who she is. Separating the art from the artist is a long-standing rule in Tar's mind, and it has shaped who she is. She's built her identity around this rule. Her life is hinging on this rule. And as this rule goes away, because the new generation is starting to build up new rules for how we should judge art and artists, she completely falls. Tar is a very manipulative person in a position of power who uses her power to protect her image even as she does very questionable things, like awarding young women that she's attracted to with special positions and solos in her orchestra. We can see that the orchestra knows what she's doing and they know that this is a long-standing pattern of behavior from her. And the reason they stay silent is because Tar will get rid of them from the orchestra. And at worst, which is, you know, what we saw with the way that she treated Krista, she could sabotage and ruin their entire career. And we see in Tar's sent folder in her emails, something very disturbing that she had 
email blasted all these people and told them do not work with this person they're not trustworthy and basically destroyed her career despite that we learn that Krista had a lot of promise and talent. And this is even said to be a large factor in why Krista killed herself. If you're hoping that this video will explain exactly what happened with Krista's relationship, I think there are some hints, but it's definitely intentionally ambiguous. We get this brief flash of the two of them in clearly some kind of sexual relationship. And there's also this mysterious pattern that is often associated with Krista. My theory is that this is just a pattern that Krista like used to doodle on stuff. And it's just a way for the audience to understand what things may belong to her. Like it's drawn on the metronome. I don't know if it's was like her metronome. And it's also on this piece of paper that Tar finds and what I assume is Krista's house next to a piece of paper where Krista wrote that Tar is a rat. And if you don't buy that this pattern has anything to do with Krista, just take a look at the cheat sheet, which is the second trailer, which shows an image that wasn't even used in the movie where Krista has this pattern all over her face. And we know it's Krista because her hair is orange. So if Krista's calling Tara a rat, I think generally you would say that to somebody who maybe betrayed you or cheated on you. And perhaps that is what happened. Tara like, you know, shifted her interest towards yet another girl. That's probably the best theory that I would have, but we don't know exactly. Maybe the relationship bordered on manipulation or abuse, but it's part of the point of the movie, I think, that we don't know all the details and we're supposed to fill in the blanks because we often don't have 100% of the information when we're looking at abuse cases with public figures. Like there's no crystal clear portrait for us of what truly really happened that's 100% accurate and objectively verifiable. But we obviously get clues based on Tara's current behavior as to how she probably reacted in the, in the past. In fact, sometimes you really wonder, does Tara even know if what she's doing is wrong or is she just following a set of rules that she thinks that she is entitled to follow based on her position of power. She may even feel that her power entitles her to have these relationships with women and that this is all just the rules of the game. Something else this movie made me think about is how when we're discussing figures getting canceled and whether or not that's like fair that they're getting canceled, we often don't consider how the broader consequences of these abuses of power do end up pushing people out of industries in creating environments that are unfair or unsafe. So really we can discuss, you know, how Tar was canceled by the public, but there's also a story here of Krista being canceled, in a sense, by Tar herself. Lydia Tar is extremely image conscious as well, to the point where she is editing her own Wikipedia page. And her nightmare is for the public to not be in sync with this image that she's working so desperately to create. And she has these nightmares of people whispering behind her back. And the few times in the movie where we break away from Tar's perspective is when we look at the phone of her assistant texting about her. And these moments remind us that Tara is not completely in control of her image, even though she thinks that she is. So Tara is held accountable for her actions in this movie in the very specific way that this generation holds people accountable, which means they don't get to work anymore in this field. They don't get to contribute artistically anymore. Their personal life goes to shambles and their influence and work as an artist will be more scrutinized and possibly lost. At the end of the movie, Lydia's forced to work in Asia in a place that is totally foreign to her. And she has to conduct music that she has like no experience conducting and has really nothing to do with her work. And the end of the film, she's conducting a piece that seems very silly for her to be conducting. And the last shot is this dolly where we see that the audience is dressed in these crazy elaborate like fandom costumes and then the movie ends on this shot and then we hear like EDM music playing over the credits which I'm sure is music that Lydia Tarr would want absolutely nothing to do with. So really the final shot in the last scene is just to show the distance that now exists between Lydia Tarr and the art that she's creating. There's a moment towards the end where she is moved to tears by this video of Leonard Bernstein talking about how music can express the emotions that words just cannot. And this seems to be like the core motivation of why Lydia Tarr finds music to be so beautiful and fulfilling. I think that she makes music from a very deep and intuitive place that she may not even fully understand. And one source that we do know her music is inspired by is her daughter. She's writing a song throughout the movie called For Petra. And she's influenced by the purity and the love in this relationship, which is said by her wife, Sophie, to be the only real relationship that she has in her life. And even the relationship she has with her wife 
is somewhat transactional. So when Lydia is canceled, she doesn't just lose the resources to create. She doesn't just lose her influence. She loses the flame that sparks her beautiful creations. But I think the movie's also asking us, did she really lose these things because she got like canceled or is it because she failed as a human being? She favored power over art. And I think that's why the movie opens with these reverse credits to show all the names involved starting from the ones who would be least likely to be recognized to the ones at the top. I think the opening credit scroll is almost a caution against giving the power to those at the top or against boosting the ego of the artist because it's dangerous letting all that power get to somebody. It almost humbles the director Todd Field of this movie and perhaps even like, you know, the main actor of the movie, Kate Blanchett. Now, speaking of Lydia's personal life, I think we got to talk about the relationship that she has with her wife and her family as a whole. When Tar comes home in the beginning of the movie, we see her immediately solve two problems going on at home. One is where she finds her wife's pill that's been like distressing her, like immediately she finds it, she gives it to her, and then her daughter is having a problem at school, which she immediately solves and takes action on. That's her role at her home in a nutshell. Her home life is like an orchestra, and her job as the conductor is to make sure every piece is doing its part and everything is functioning properly. And when things are going well or going poorly in her life, that's often represented musically. Like even her relationship with her daughter, when we see them kind of open up with each other in the car, that's because Tar initiates like singing a song with her. And when things go wrong, it's often manifested in the form of like an unwanted noise in her house, like the ticking of a metronome. And as the perfectionist that she is, she can't handle any of these missing pieces. It's as if there's a detuned instrument in in her orchestra that she has to sniff out. Every aspect of her life and her personality is finely tuned and it's her job to make sure that things stay that way. And when her life falls apart, we see unwanted noises. We see her image literally tarnished when she falls and hits her face and has this mark on it. And there's this moment where she goes next door because her neighbor calls her for help to help this old woman up who's fallen out of her chair and it smells like shit in this apartment and that really disturbs her. It's like her greatest fear is just being helpless on the floor, not being able to control your own smell. Like when she gets back to the apartment, she's just furiously scrubbing herself down. That loss of control is her nightmare. So her wife, Sharon, played by Nina Haas, follows a set of rules with Lydia that are established for their relationship to work. And those are kind of the same rules that Tar uses in the rest of her life, which really is do not question what goes on in the personal life. Tar will provide the family financially. She'll take care of Petra. She'll ensure that things are stable. And in return, her wife will not question these affairs that she's having and these relationships she's having with young women, even though she knows that it's going on. And in the scene where Sharon is leaving, she says, I don't even care what you did with those women. The reason I'm upset is because you broke the biggest rule that we had, which is that family comes first. And Lydia broke this rule because she didn't warn her family of this impending storm and because she's lost control over everything that's happened in her life. And that was the main promise that she's made to her family. Some people like to say, you know, there's no such thing as cancel culture, but this movie definitely makes the case that there is. Not that it's necessarily good or bad. If Lydia Tarr lived in the time period that she thinks that she's living in with the rules that she thinks are established, she simply would be able to get away with these behaviors. But I think the film is also showing us how we shouldn't just view these stories as people like getting canceled, but rather as tales of powerful people whose ego and pride lead them to abuses of power in a world that doesn't want to accept that anymore. The goal of this movie, I think, is to have us step back from these sensational conversations we usually have when discussing these topics and to observe it in the form of this slow motion fallout, never leaving the side of this woman who is at the center of it all. And we observe the way that she abuses her power and where she gets the roadmap for how to use her power in this way. And we also see a world that is changing its rules when it comes to power and abuse and accountability and the unraveling of the life of somebody 
who never accounted for the rules that they were following to change. What you take away from this movie will probably say a lot about you and your opinions on these topics. I mean, certainly everybody will say like Lydia Tarr deserved some accountability for her actions. The movie's definitely not ambiguous on that front. It's definitely not a movie about someone who gets unfairly canceled. Although the movie does show how some of the information that is out for the public is misleading even though other pieces of it are very true. But you can still think that maybe she deserves some form of accountability, but that this doesn't mean that we can just throw this artist's work aside because they weren't a good person. And then someone else could say, well, I disagree because identity always informs how you consume your art. And this movie even makes the case for that. Even this person who claims to have obliterated her identity has built her identity around these figures of the past. And even as a woman, she's had to work extra hard in this industry to uphold her reputation. And how can you say that identity doesn't play a factor when the history of music that she's pulling from is all people who have the same identity? And you're gonna tell me there's no identity politics there? There's always been identity politics. We just didn't notice them. I've read some reviews that think that the movie is about things that I didn't even mention. I've seen takes from people who think that the movie is like clearly on one side or the other of the art versus artist debate. So I guess the final point I wanna make is that this analysis shouldn't be viewed as like the be all end all of tar analyses. It is merely what I took away from it. Hope you enjoyed this analysis of tar. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. Should we separate your art from your identity?